Hi everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is Watch Art Side, the art and science of watch collection. Every now and then I like to stop and reflect on a very important element. I think that watch collectors, especially the more those of you who are connoisseurs or near connoisseurs, need to consider and that is the whole issue of constant force. And in a nutshell, what constant force refers to is the, the line that you have in what we'll call the power line as the, the spring on your watch unwinds. It starts off because it has a lot of pressure, very strong, and then it gets weaker and weaker. Uh, I made a little chart there, the strongest 20%, and then there's sort of the 60% in the middle that's uh, close to ideal, and then at the end you have the weakest. And if you've ever seen a toy that's a wind-up toy and going around, and then near the end it's junk, 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 watches are the same. And in order to keep accurate time for a mechanical watch, you need something to smooth out the time so that you have it's it's fairly constant so that's what i thought would be a, a good thing to do today is take a look at the different mechanisms for constant time or constant force really now the first one that i want to look at is, is a pretty simple one really and it's dual barrels in parallel and while you still while you still have some loss of constancy, the dual barrels in parallel, instead of having one barrel that you can pretty well predict that'll poop out, uh, or if you have two barrels in sequence, one poops out and the other one takes over. Uh, what dual barrels dual barrels in parallel? They have both of the barrels working at the same time on the same movement. And so you, instead of having one barrel, you have a couple of them. Uh, there are a couple examples there up at the top is the FP Jorn uh, caliber 1304. And you can see the two barrels and the both of them are right on top of the center center's uh, gear that goes down to the uh, gear train and eventually moves the hands in the watch. Uh, the three that I have here, the first one, F.P. Jorn from the um, Chromomet Souverain, the movement, as I mentioned, is caliber 1304. Uh, the important thing about that is that it is it improves the timekeeping, okay? Uh, below that is the Schwartz ETN MSC 311. The thing is that e, uh, Schwartz ETN did that I think is really interesting is that they have the same base with these two identical cavities. Uh, and one cavity, well, you can put barrels, one barrel in one and one in the other. So there's where you get your double barrel. Um, but the other part of it is, is that uh, the, ASC for automatic movement uh, simply has a single barrel and then in the other one it puts in a micro rotor which is sort of a cool thing I think. Um, the FP Jorn is, is insanely expensive now. The Schwartz ETN, if you can find a used one with the MSC uh, movement, you might be able to find a pretty good deal. Now, if you want one that's really cheap, in fact, it's under $100, uh, I found a uh, Favre Luba Twin Power. It's got a caliber 259 in it. And uh, uh, the picture that I have there in the lower right, uh, what it is, is the, I took the plates off and then I took a picture of, and you can see the center wheel and both of the uh, gears, the, the in the barrel engaging the uh, center wheel and so it's 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 a lot smoother and it's you don't have as much 
kicking and stumbling as you would have with with a single barrel. Okay, so that's sort of a, it's, it's perhaps not the best, but it's certainly one that I think is worth considering. Now, uh, the second one is known as the Maltese Cross. And there, there, are different, there are different ones, different uses of the Maltese Cross. They're also referred to as the Geneva Stopworks. And the Maltese Cross can be used in a lot of different ways. Essentially what it is, it's got um, about five prongs on it. And one prong is sort of goes over, the other ones go under. And what that is, is that there's a little, like a cam that goes around. And as it turns, it goes into one of the little square uh, openings. And then the wheel comes around. And then the, the ones that are like this, it can just go through. On the other half, it's like this. They hit it and they stop, and that's why it's called a stop work. Um, and so, the the principal use of this particular one is to stop the winding. All right. And so, essentially, what you do is that you have it wound up to you wind it up all the way, or you wind it up part of the way. And before it gets to that top 20% that has the most power, you stop. And so like that chart there shows is that you have, you have a sort of the more ideal level of power from the mainspring. So this is, it, it, it essentially winds up to the optimum. Now you may wonder, what about the other end? Uh, the slow in, uh, it, well, it just takes care of one of them, <laughs> you know, one end on that, but there's more to it. I've seen the Maltese cross used in a lot of different places uh, within a watch that they will limit the amount of power and they'll stop it when it goes through the cycles until it hits that uh, stop prong on it. Okay, so that's a that's a second way. Now, this next one, Remitois Galate, is my favorite. Essentially, this is what happens. Um, you have a, in order to have this constant force, and you have it with the power running out. Now, in that illustration, I don't know if you can see it, you have a red line and a green line. The red line is the use of the, the power of the mainspring over time. And it starts up strong, and then it goes down, and then it goes way down. With a Rematois Galate, essentially what it does is that it, it's got the mainspring winding a little intermediary string, spring. And what that intermediate intermediary string spring does it stays constant from the constant rewinding that it has and it's the one that kicks the escape wheel and so in that way the escape wheel can have a, a an even turning and so that it doesn't matter where the the power is the power level of the mainspring is because it's it's getting all of its signals for it's time to to uh, release another piece of power. Um, I don't know, it's sort of hard to come up with an analogy of that because it's only one of the ones has to be rewound all the time. Let's take a look at some different uh, ways that they've done this. It's to me, it's one of the extremely interesting. Uh, there was a guy named Derek Pratt, and you probably never heard of him. He was a good friend of George Daniels, and they communicated a whole lot. For years, he was one of the uh, uh, designers and movement developers at Urban Jurgensen. And what he did, he, he developed different ways to introduce a Rimantoi Galate into a watch. 
uh, up at the top, there's some, sort of an interesting approach. He used pieces of cardboard. Uh, uh, he and George Daniels were at, they went and visited some watchmaking company and they were talking about their CAD, uh, uh, using CAD for development on the computers. And uh, they said, well, we've got card. <laughs> you may have CAD. So anyway, so that's using these um, twin, uh, yeah, twin escape wheels uh, and a very interesting uh, pallet fork, I guess you could call it a pallet fork, how it would, the rubber bands representing what was rewound and the way it was rewound was the power from the mainspring. So you have a lesser spring uh, being wound by a stronger spring, essentially what a, a rim and, uh, the way a rim and taw works. Now down at the bottom, there are a couple illustrations from Derek Pratt's work. And in the, the, the way it is working is that you have a three-pronged or a three-lobe cam and the cam looks like the rotor in a wankel a wankel engine. And what it's doing, it's moving the fork. It, it has a fork with a, almost like a square pitchfork type of fork with no teeth in it. And in the middle, this, um, I'll call it this the three, three lobe uh, cam is moving. And so what it is doing, it's moving the pallet fork. Now, outside of that, there's a three-tooth wheel coming off the points of the uh, three-lobe cam. And what it's doing, it's locking and releasing the, the energy from the uh, eventually, ultimately from the mainspring uh, and then it's also rewinding the remontoire spring. Uh, there's a illustration over to down at the lower right. Um, it's you know when you when you look at it, it's really brilliant watchmaking. Uh, unfortunately, Derek Pratt died fairly young, and before he could really make a watch uh, with this kind of rim and twan, and he did, he passed away. But a guy named uh, Luca Soprana picked it up and uh, recently uh, created a watch that was in the GPHC and made nominations. And over there in the lower right, you can see, uh, see the setup uh, for it. It's, it's one of the more difficult, <laughs> I put it mildly, uh, mechanisms to put in a watch. That's why you don't see too many rim and toy galatees. The one you see cost a fortune. Now here are four different ones in addition to the um, to the ones we just saw. The rim and toy galate, there's uh, one in the uh, uh, Langa A, uh, Langa Unsunde, uh, Lang 31. Uh, Gronfeld has a rim and toy and there's are every one of them is a little different view of how to do it. Uh, there's a Gerbel uh, Force with a differential uh, degalite, same idea. By the way, too, I was talking with Stephen uh, Force at uh, some of us at one of the watch shows, and I asked him, I said, How come more people don't do the uh, Rim and Trois Galate? And he told me, he said, Because they're really hard to make, which wasn't what I was hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's the way it goes. And the one on the lower uh, right is uh, Ferdinand Berthold's uh, Chroman FB2RE, a strange name. But all of them have a rim and the, and the rim and has that little spring in it. The one with Ferdinand Berthold, I think there's either he influenced um, Derek Pratt or Derek Pratt influenced him because there you can see that little square end um, pallet uh, fork. Okay, uh, now the last thing I want to talk about, uh, the last constant force, is 
Fuzian chain. And the Fuzian chain is, on the one hand, it, it, to me, it's one of the more simpler ones. So what you have is a mainspring unwinds, the chain pulls from the fusée. Now the fusée looks like a little tower and the and the chain is wound around it. Now at the top you have the the smallest uh, amount of chain is used and so you, you have a, a certain amount of of tension but it's not as much because the tension is within the mainspring itself okay because when you get it all wound up and then as it goes down the fusée comes unwound and the chain is keep pulling as it is what it's re being released to is a tighter one because it's on a, a bigger level of the little fusée uh, tower. Um, when it, so when it's fully wound, the chain is wrapped around the narrowest part of the fusée, namely at the top. And as it unwinds, the chain wraps around to the wider parts, ensuring constant torque until the watch runs out of power. Now, in the lower right, there's a small cam uh, chain that Roman Gauthier put together in a what's called the logical one. <laughs> First of all, the chain itself is incredible because it's got all these little ruby <laughs> uh, ladder steps in it amazing thing. But what he did, instead of using a fusee, he used a snail cam. And a snail cam is a is a cam that is has this sort of what it has a, what like a drop as the as it comes around was it drops back to the beginning and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then drops again. Uh, this is exactly the way this is set up. You can see the, uh, in, the in the picture, you, there you have the chain. Instead of a fusee, you can see there's a, um, a snail cam. Anyway, uh, these are things like I, at the outset, I said, to, you know, so you don't want to be the most clueless guy at the watch show and people are talking about these things. And you have some idea of what they're talking about. And you can also, you might say, hey, you know, I, you know, what, what kind of watch can you get for that? Well, first of all, the only ones I know of that are currently built are really expensive. However, uh, there are a lot of vintage pocket watches that you can get for very reasonable prices uh, with a Fuji and chain. Uh, you got to be sure that it's still working because a lot of the older ones don't. Uh, but uh, this is a, this is sort of an interesting one because it's available uh, even though you have to go to vintage to get it. Anyway, again, this is not the first time I've talked about constant force, but it's it's one I think is important. I keep coming back to it every so often uh, because it's good to learn about these kinds of things. Anyway, um, that's it. I'd really like your feedback on this, and uh, this is an opportunity to subscribe if you like. And until next time, this is Bill Sanders for Watch Art Sci, the art and science of what's collected.